Hello everyone, welcome to the news desk. That little timer in the top left hand corner of your screen means we are almost done with the main elements of round one. Rich Hagen sitting alongside Ian Duke from Inside R&D. And Ian, you're gonna walk us through not just the R&D perspective, but a high level player perspective on some of the draft archetypes. Now, uh, we're gonna start with some of the allied colors. What, is, what does that mean exactly? We'll call them friendly colors, not to be confusing with the allies in Battle for Zendikar. Uh, all right. Um, so in Magic, there are five colors. Each of them has two friends and two enemies. So right now we're gonna go over the five combinations out of 10 two color combinations that are friendly with each other. Okay, and the best way of thinking of that is if you think of the five colors of Magic going around in a circle, you just look at what's next door That's both right. ways. So if I'm blue, I look one way I see white, I look the other way I see black, they are my friendly color pairs. That's right, and okay. those are the first two combinations we'll begin with, actually. All right, so why don't we take a look at white, blue, and we're going to see what picks you at home have done in your most successful draft drafting on Magic Online. So what is uh, White Blue attempting to do, Ian? So we're calling it the Awaken Tempo deck. You can think of it as kind of like a stall the ground and win with flyers, but it also plays a lot of Awaken cards. Um, and one of the cool things about this color combination is we talked a lot about Battle for Zendikar being a very synergy-driven driven format, meaning you need combinations of cards to make your deck really powerful. White Blue is probably the least synergy-driven of the color combinations, and a lot of players like it for that reason. You can sort of just pick up good cards and have a good deck and not need to worry about much else. Right, it's sort of the, the, the archetype that feels most like, almost like a core set uh, draft deck that That's you end right. up It's like, here's my 2-2 two, two fly for three, here's my 3-2 fly with a bit of an upside at four maybe, here's my 4-4 four, four flyer at five, here's a bounce spell, here's a trick, here's a counter spell, like real, real sort of clean, classic magic. Yeah, exactly. Um, although there are some pretty cool synergies that come up. You have a Halmar Tide caller to get back uh, Awaken cards. Mm -hmm. And Awaken actually has some interesting synergy with itself in that if you have multiple Awaken cards, you can choose, do I want to put all the counters on one land and go tall? Do I want to spread them out and go wide? Um, so a lot of interesting decisions there, and the Awaken cards definitely give you a powerful long game too. Okay, why don't we take a look at the top five commons that you've been picking on Magic Online in winning drafts. So let's move on and take a look at the top com commons. There you see Eldrazi, Sky Spawner, Gideon's Reproach, Sheardrop, Clutch of Currents, and Cloud Manta. So it's a little bit unusual to see a blue creature at the top of the pick order list, but Eldrazi Sky Spawner, absolutely fantastic. You get a 2-1 flyer plus a Scion. That's a 3-2 worth of uh, creature for just three mana. Two of it's flying. You can sacrifice the spawn for mana. Just a really flexible card that gives you a lot. All right, why don't we take a look at the top five uncommons then, and we begin with a gold card, Royal Spout, one white and blue. Yeah, Royal Spout, it's sort of what we call the guidepost uncommon for this deck. It's the card that if you see it, maybe second, third, fourth pick, you can deduce that this color combination is open and sort of jump right into it. Um, Royal Spout, just an awesome card for tempo. The Awaken is fantastic. You can get a 4-4 creature and uh, sort of time ebb your opponent, set them back a turn. Uh, for just six mana, really great there. Halimar Tidecaller we talked about, um, an efficient creature that gets back an Awakened card, just gives you card advantage, keeps things flowing, and then a couple, you know, we have Stasis Snare there as a removal spell, um, and a couple other solid creatures rounding out the list. For people playing with Awaken who haven't got a lot of experience of the game, uh, it's an unusual mechanic because it does invite you to play it twice, uh, if you like, mm -hmm. either down at one, in this case Royal Spout at three, or at six, and there, there's a lot of gap in some of the Awakens. It's mm -hmm. one and five, it's two and six. That's an awful lot of time within a game for them to choose between. By and large, what's the rule of thumb for what people want to do with their Awaken cards? Are they meant to be burnt through on turns one, two, three? Is that a bad sign for your deck for the most part? I don't think so necessarily. I mean, the rule of thumb is just if you need it, use it. Um, the, the Awaken cards are all fairly efficient whether you're just using them for their base effect or whether you're waiting to awaken them later on. And so I would just say if you need them for the early tempo, go ahead and use it, bounce your creature back with a clutch of currents or whatever, and then later on in the game when you have the mana, well, go ahead and awaken. All right, so that's blue-white. We're gonna stay with blue and go the other way. We're gonna pair up with black, another friendly pair. So let's take a look at what blue-black is trying to do. Blue-black is the ingest process deck. Uh, ingest, of course, being a keyword on many Eldrazi that when they damage your opponent in combat, they exile the top card of your opponent's library. And then Processor Eldrazi can use these exiled cards as fuel to generate extra effects. So uh, in R&D speak, an, an A plus B mechanic. 
Yeah, very much so. That means you need to combine sort of two different things together. You need a way of exiling cards, and then you need a processor to take advantage of those cards being exiled. Well, given that that's true, that makes the pick orders really interesting because are people just going to be, we must have ingest because without ingest, process doesn't do anything, or do we say we must have the payoff with process, mm -hmm. and then we'll worry about how we make that happen later in the draft. Why don't we see what the top five common picks were for this particular archetype? So here we are, Eldrazi Sky Spawner again, because that's a super popular card, it does not ingest. Complete disregard removal, then Benthic Infiltrator and Mist Intruder, you see them on the screen there, both of those do ingest, and then a slightly strange one because it doesn't fit directly really from the previous mm -hmm. archetype, Clutch of Currents. So the Sky Spawner we already talked about, fantastic in any deck. Uh, complete Disregard though is a card I really want to highlight here. It's an efficient removal spell, exiles a creature with power three or less for just three mana, and the important part there is it actually exiles the creature. So this is a way to get cards into your opponent's exile zone without necessarily connecting with an ingest creature, and that's really powerful. Right, in some ways, Complete Disregard I think of as Ruin Processor's best friend. Oh, for Be sure. Because Ruin Processor can go in anything because it's colorless. It's a seven, eight, you gain five life if you happen to be able to do the processing, and and a complete disregard can be an incidental card that just because you happen to be black, yep, there goes one thing, I'll use that one thing to gain my five light when I make the processor. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. What about the uncommons then? Let's take a look uh, at those. We've seen the Benthic Infiltrator and Mist Intruder. Do we have more ingest here? Oh yes, indeed we do. We have Ruination Guide. It's one of my favorite cards to mm -hmm. open because it is such a signpost. Yeah, Ruination Gu Guide is just fantastic by itself. Um, because of the nature of this deck being centered in Eldrazi mechanics, you tend to have a lot of Devoid cards anyway, and Ruination Guide just kind of turbocharges all of your creatures. Your Benthic Infiltrators and Mist Intruders normally only have one power, but they have Evasion. Now they have two. They're hitting twice as hard. Um, Ulamog's Nullifier, another card to highlight here. It's a little bit hard to get going because it does require processing two cards, right. but it's extremely powerful. Getting a four mana, two, three Flash Flyer is already a great deal. And if you can counter a spell with it, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, especially as something that came out of the Grand Prix last weekend in Madison is that in terms of, uh, you talk in R&D about play patterns, like what when you watch a game, what is going on on the battlefield? We saw so many triple and quad and even five creatures blocking one huge creature, an 8-9 Eldrazi Devastator, 3-on-1, 4-on-1, 5-on-1, um, and a card like Ulamog's Nullifies, they go, oh, I'm going to sure strike my man. And you're like, well, actually, not <laughs> only are you not, I've now got a 2-3 here as well, and all sorts of combat carnage can ensue. Mm -hmm. So a really great card there. All right, so uh, that's blue-black. We've seen two blue archetypes. Let's keep the black, and this time, let's move around to black-red. So Black Red, we call it the Devoid Aggro deck. Um, you're gonna be playing a lot of Eldrazi cards here as well, and you're getting bonuses for the fact that they're colorless. So really trying to curve out with aggressive creatures and leverage the synergy of these colorless matters cards. All right, why don't we take a look at the top five commons. So we've got Touch of the Void, Removal, Nettle Drone, Repeated Source of Damage, Complete Disregard, Removal, Dominated Drone has the trigger when it enters the battlefield, and outnumber more removal. So not much to say about Touch of the Void, just an efficient removal spell, happens to have Devoid as well, so it can key into your other um, colorless synergies. Nettle Drone is, is really a um, great example of a card that works super wonderful, wonderfully well in this deck. 3-1 uh, creature for three mana, sometimes you're just getting in some attacks for three, but if the board stalls out, uh, and in addition, anytime you cast a colorless spell, you're getting in those extra pings with it, that damage really adds up. Um, similarly with Dominator Drone, you're perfectly happy to play a three mana, three two creature in an aggressive deck, but uh, you, if you can get some extra damage from the colorless synergies, it's just fantastic. All right, let's move on to the top five uncommons then. Here we are now. Forerunner of Slaughter is a very interesting card because in a set that depends on both colorless cards and also very specifically cards being colored, um, this is part of a cycle of these uh, gold cards that really point you in a direction. And again, you open this in draft, you can pick it straight up and go, well, I now have a plan as early as pick one. Yeah, I mean, Forerunner of Slaughter, just an awesome card. Two mana, three power creature, that's great. If you play it on turn three, it can give itself haste. That's great. Any creature that with Devoid you play afterwards, uh, it can also give haste. Just one of the best cards in this archetype for sure. Following that up, Rolling Thunder, one of the top uncommons. We've seen this do a lot of work at the, the GP last weekend. 
Um, just an awesome removal spell, not much else to say there. And then Vile Aggravate, oh. last card I want to highlight here. This is a card that's been super high in people's pick orders here this weekend at the Pro Tour. Um, it just it's just really powerful. Often comes down as a 3-5 a creature for 3 mana. Right. Well, the, th the thing about Vile Aggregate is Magic has a long and rich history of making people not understand what a star means. Right? On, sure. On the card. <laughs> Think Tarmogoyf. Uh -huh. What is this 0 plus star, 1 plus star? And people really struggle to evaluate that. And when Vile Aggregate first appeared, a lot of people were saying, why would I want a 1-5 for 3 with with Trample, what's the point of that? But as soon as you start playing it in, in games, yes, it comes down as maybe a 2-5 or a 3-5, but by the time it's hitting, it's often a 6-5, 7-5, 8-5. I mean, you, right. can, you can do absurd things with that for three mana. Yeah, I mean, the key about drafting is you might look at this card and say, well, how many colorless creatures am I really going to have in my deck? All when you're them. drafting, you get to all choose. Yeah, and often in this black-red <laughs> archetype, all your creatures are colorless anyway, so it's just great. All right, uh, I like black-red uh, a lot. Next, we move on to red green. So this is the Landfall deck. Yeah, we saw um, Brian Kibler draft this earlier this morning. Um, red green is Landfall. You're playing aggressive creatures. Of course, uh, since they're keying off of Landfall triggers, these creatures are often more powerful on your own turn after you've played a land, which means they're better for, with attack, for, they're better for attacking than they are for blocking, and that's what you want to be doing with this deck. There's a card on screen there, Akum Firebird, and I love the really small things that are within a set. Now, this has got a great ability, land for you can pay six, bring it back from your graveyard to the battlefield. That sounds like it never goes away, and that's true in many sets. But we've seen a simple card like Complete Disregard that exiles a card with three power or less, and yep. it just turns out that turns off a Coombe Firebird completely. And that's just, you know, there are lots of it's sort of little hidden nuggets within sets, mm -hmm. which are great to discover when you play a game and you go, I'm going to make my Akum Firebird, and they go, completely disregard it. Get it gone. Lovely. Great stuff. Let's look at the commons. There we go. What do you what stands out there for you in? Snapping Gnarled and Valka Predator, just excellent examples of efficient landfall creatures here. These are kind of the meat and potatoes of this deck. You want as many copies as you can get. Um, Valka Predator in particular, I mean it's attacking for it's a three-mana creature, but it's attacking for four the following turn. That's just huge. And if you can combine these landfall creatures with things like Evolving Wilds, or maybe even get lucky and get an expedition fetch land or something along those lines. Uh, they're just really, really powerful. Yeah, it's also noticeable that a card like Nettle Drone, which we saw earlier, 3-1 three, for 3 with its repeated ping ability, doesn't quite belong here. And that's, that's a skill in design mm -hmm. to make sure that people are going to generally prioritize the Slide Runner, the Gnarlid, the Predator, over things like that, so that Nettle Drone gets to belong elsewhere in the draft. That's right. Great yeah, point. Great stuff. All right, uh, let's take a look then at our top five uncommons. These are the cards, remember, that you are drafting in your winning decks on Magic Online. Picks first through fifth. So uh, what stands out on the uncommons, apart from Rolling Thunder, because we talked about that right. once. Yeah, that you're happy to have at any red deck. Grove Rumbler, um, a great example here. It's got landfall. It gets bigger. It's just what your deck wants to do. That one's pretty straightforward. Uh, Turn Against, a uh, pretty powerful card here. It's like an active treason type card, but it's an instant, so you can surprise your opponent with it in combat. Okay, now I have a question for you about Tajiru Warcaller. Does R&D secretly delight in printing cards that look implausibly terrible at first glance that are in fact super, super good? Because I don't know how you could make that card look less appealing at first blush. It's not just five mana for a 2-1, it even requires double green. And that's before we get into conversations about maybe green is not as strong as some of the other colors in draft. I mean, oh, in theory, it's horrible, and yet absolutely tremendous. Talk us about that card. Interesting you should say this card looks, uh, looks worse than it is because it actually fooled us a little bit as well. When we started off playtesting, this card was a five mana 2-2 two, two, haste. So not only did it have an extra toughness, but it actually itself had a haste Whoa. and would give itself the bonus <laughs> when it came into play. So it was an extra 4-4 four, four attacker on top of, if you've ever played with the card, you know it's powerful right. once it actually hits the board. Yeah, it's it's one of the cards, uh, certainly in Limited, that, you know, if particularly in Sealed, for example, if I open that, that card in a Sealed pool, that's a card that really pulls me towards, okay, just how many allies do I have? Because you do that once when it just comes, comes into play, enters the battlefield, you're in great shape. You do it twice, you've probably won. 
Yeah, and the, the key is it actually triggers itself when it enters the battlefield and gives your whole team plus two, two, plus two. So it's already a mini overrun by itself. And even if you don't have a lot of ally synergies, maybe you're actually more of an Eldrazi Cyan deck and you're kind of going wide with lots of tokens. It's great in there as well, even if you don't have more allies. Okay. Um, is We've mentioned that green is perhaps, particularly in this room, full of pros maybe underappreciated. If you're opening a Grove Rumbler, because this again, we're in the, the uncommon gold part of the set, is that a card you're thinking about first picking precisely because you already anticipate that green may be open? That could be the case. Um, there's always sort of this tough decision with these multicolor cards. Do I pick one right off the bat? I mean, they're all very powerful. Do I pick one and sort of jump right into the archetype? Or do I maybe pass it around and send that signal downstream to the person to my left and wait and see what comes to me? It's an interesting debate. Lots of people have different opinions. Uh, I personally would probably not jump right in on a gro Grove Rumbler, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely something that's worth considering. All right. Um, and it's the kind of thing, if you're going to draft once or twice at every Friday Night Magic, it's well worth trying once just for the experience of, you know, do I get all this green that's mm -hmm. supposedly floating around the table. Yep. You know, and so. Landfall is definitely one of the easier archetypes to build and play, I think. So if you're just getting started with the set, I, that's a definitely a, an excellent one to jump in with. All right, great stuff. So that's red-green. Let's keep green front and center, and let's move to its other friendly pair. Let's go green-white, and let's go wide. Yeah, green-white's the go-wide deck. This is sort of, in my mind, the bridge between the Zendikari and Eldrazi sides of the conflict. Huh, okay. In that uh, green and white together have lots of abilities that sort of boost your whole team, like the Tajuru Warcaller that we talked about earlier. And of course, those are best when you have more and more creatures on the battlefield. And what better way to get lots of creatures on the battlefield than Eldrazi Scions? Yeah, now let, let's take a moment while we're here to talk about the Scions, because uh, I think it was easy enough for people to say they are different to the spawn, Clearly, 1-1 one, one is different just numerically to 0-1, but I'm not sure that everyone fully grasped just how different they were and how incredibly different the set plays as a result. Definitely. I mean, the, the main difference is Eldrazi Signs can attack and they can trade in combat um, when you're comparing them to Eldrazi Spawn, which means they're a little bit more useful to remain on the battlefield, and so it's a little bit more costly, in a sense, an opportunity cost sort of a sense, to sacrifice them to get mana to play bigger Eldrazi. So um, that's sort of where the bridging comes in, where this green-white archetype is leveraging the combat stats of the Scions more so than sacrificing them for mana. All right, so why don't we take a look at what you've been picking in your successful winning Magic Online decks if you are green-white. Gideon's Reproach, fantastic removal spell. It's great in combat. As you said, Rich, there's a lot of double and triple blocking or you know, involved combat steps uh, in this format. And so being able to disrupt your opponent by killing one of their creatures as a surprise in combat is huge. Um, Snapping Gnarled, one of the best green commons. It's great in a dedicated landfall deck. It's also just great in any old deck. So we see that here. Um, Sheer Drop, uh, this is a card that's just a great removal spell. It also has Awaken, so it can give you some extra punch in the late game. Uh, it's in the nature uh, of the game that if, you're, if you do get good, you understand the set. The white removal feels to me like you always have a bit of a sigh when it happens to you. It's like, I'm gonna attack. Yeah, you're gonna get in to approach me, aren't you? And then, I'm gonna attack. Great, I got in. Yeah, you're gonna sheer drop me, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I think and that's then, because the white removal, it's a little bit more situational. It's telegraphed, isn't it? You yeah. know, and then you go, I'm going to make my guy enormous and come in. You're, you're going to smite me, aren't you? Right. And, and they do. And they absolutely do. I think the, the one that you don't see coming is the uncommon Royals Retribution because yep. it costs five um, and it is uncommon. So you don't, it's just not seen as much at the table. It's not something you can particularly play around. And then that does, can really do some things. Why don't we see whether that's in the top uncommon picks for Green White? Let's take a look. Nope. Speaking of unconditional removal that you can't really <laughs> play around, Stasis Snare was the one that came to mind for me. Um, this is a instant speed Oblivion Ring variant. Um, you can take out a creature temporarily. Of course, they can bring it back if they have like a Felidar Cub or some, some other way to destroy an enchantment. But um, by and large, this is just one of the most efficient single target removal spells in the set. Uh, traditionally, uh, one of the top tips to newer players is life gain, not very good. Um, but that's not always true. Uh, Angel of Renewal, we talk about incidental life gain. Mm -hmm. Angel of Renewal is a 4-4 flyer. Thanks very much. Brackets, it happens to enter the battlefield and gain you some life. That makes it good. 
Yeah, and this is the deck it's probably at its best in, since you are going wide often with lots of tokens or lots of little allies. Angel of Renewal is just a great curve topper. 4-4 four, four Flyer is great, and gaining lots of life is great. Awesome card. All right, so there you have it. That's part one of our Battle for Zendikar Draft Archetypes.